Welcome to Inside, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Rebecca Medrano, co-founder and executive director of Gala Hispanic Theater. Rebecca has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. The Gala Hispanic Theater. Talk about the Gala Hispanic Theater and its place within the ecosystem of theater in this city, Washington, D.C. Well, that's a very good question because um, we have been here going on 42 years, which is kind of amazing for a culturally specific theater. There's been a French language theater that's come and gone. Um, and we have been very lucky to be rooted in the community that we serve and at the same time changing and adapting to that community. In 1976, when we were first established, the wave of immigration was quite different there were political exiles and they were fleeing uh, dictatorships in their countries coming to, to this country for freedom of expression. There were you know, doctors, lawyers, artists, and we became a little haven for, for these people to be able to think and to continue to create. We purchased at that time um, an, an affordable townhouse in Adams Morgan at 18th and Calorama, and we tore down the walls of a perfectly well-renovated house and created this little cafe teatro, um, sort of styled after the Argentinian small theaters. Uh, my husband, who's the co-founder, Hugo's from Argentina. And we had incredibly um, political, socio-political work there. We just attracted all of these people who had no other place to go. Then things kind of began to change. First of all, that neighborhood became gentrified. Um, we had a lot of... Um, threats, there was, it was a changing population, and we were offered the opportunity to go down to where the Shakespeare is now in the Landsberg building. And there was a, an effort to make that a community art space. That effort with the Pan American, no, was it the Pan American, not the Pan American, the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation right. eventually folded, but we did have a theater there for a while. Uh, we then lost that space, came uptown again to our stomping grounds and discovered the Sacred Heart School at Park, close to where we are now. And the nuns had basically were not using the auditorium, so we said, fine, we'll take it over. And we were there 18 years. Create art in a, in a church uh, In a church setting, in a church institution, and it was very low rent. And flash forward to 2000, they decided the archdiocese not to rent the theaters anymore. We went back downtown to the warehouse across from the convention center temporarily while we raised money to renovate uh, the Tivoli. We'd always had our eyes on it because we live in that neighborhood, and it had been boarded up for so long. So we were delighted. In, in the, the terms of the audience and the changing demographics, of course, most of the newer immigrants are from Central America, and they're mm -hmm. here for economic reasons. A harder audience to reach because they don't have the theater experience. But we've adapted our program to do a cross-section of programs that we believe is, you know, is in the interest of, of the broader Latino and non-Latino audience. So what I find so interesting about that that story is there there are certain through lines the through line of art mm. of the importance of art to anyone to anyone's life and and by by thinking about that through line it allows you to shift because as your audience shift as your community shifts you always have the art absolutely and I think also, kind of without knowing it, because we were all very young then, we were the youngsters uh, starting the theater, um, we, by doing gala, which is not a party, it's a grupo de artistas latinoamericanos, that's pan-American. So imagine the numbers of cultures that are already included that. You have the Caribbean Afro-Latino culture, you have the Andean cultures, you have the indigenous, you have the European cultures of Chile and Argentina, you have this wide scope, um, which is so enriching in terms of what you choose to program. I mean, we've, we did a Caribbean show that brought out, I mean, a Trinidadian show, and Trinidad was part of, it had a Spanish culture there as well. And we did it in Patois, French, Spanish, and English, with a, an amazing group called Three Canal that it has a music program. And it was just incredibly popular here. With So it's not just, you know, Spanish, Latin America, it's Pan-American. Talk about how you reach decisions as to what you present and what what are what are the attributes of the playwrights whose works mm. that you present? That's also a wonderful question. It's always a challenge establishing a season, especially now that we have a larger space with more fixed expenses, more staff. You know, when you're a smaller sort of everybody egalitarian group where everybody made ten thousand dollars or whatever it was 
<clears throat> it was it was easier. We could do more risky things. Now we have to do things that are going to draw audiences. So we try to combine it with new works. We do a lot of commissioning now. Um, new works that will appeal. This current this one now is a resident and playwright from Venezuela. We were the first to start doing his shows in 1980s, and now he's been he's hot internationally. It's a very first time that this show is being produced, and it's about social media, which is an all-encompassing theme. So it's in Spanish with English, but the theme is universal. And the themes are the damage that social media can inflict on people. Exactly. And interestingly enough, we thought, because in some of the social media it talks about sexting, which doesn't happen here, this sort of a provocative. We thought the schools would not, would sort of balk at that. We're sold out for the student matinees. I think the teachers are having problems with the social media intent of the students, the bullying, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great opportunity for students to come. We have a, really, I think our bread and butter now is the matinees that we do for three out of the four. We can't do it in the June show because there are no, the schools are out. But for the, re for the year up to, to June, we do shows that will appeal to students. We don't make that our only choice, but I push heavily for the art artist to try to do ones that students can see. There are some more adult themes that we do in June, but <clears throat> but really we feel it's important that they get it introduced to this culture, to this literature. It's a challenge for another reason in that the playwrights, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a boom of very socio-political theater in Latin America, right. and we loved doing that. We did that. That's dropped off. So what you have are, what is known here are the novelists, the boom novelists, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Vargas Llosa, so those plays have been adapted, but only by one or two writers. The rights are very hard to get now. And so when we do those, it's always sold out. We combine one of those with a newer play like this that may not draw as much audiences. And recently, we've been commissioning musicals. We did uh, went out on a limb, and we thought we were going to go broke. But luckily, we filled the houses with In the Heights in Spanish, which had, of course, a wide, wide appeal and was a great show to do. Talk about your education in public programs and how you interact with the schools, because the schools, particularly the public schools, don't have any money for the arts anymore, and it's the first thing that gets dropped. Right. We have uh, uh, just recently, the last, I would say five or six years, really grown the school programs by putting somebody in charge of the outreach and making sure that we keep up with the list of teachers, that we actually go to the schools, we talk to the teachers. It is hard for them to put aside money. There is something called the DC Arts and Education Collaborative, and we are a member. They're helping bring those uh, schools who can't afford to come on field trips by underwriting the cost of the tickets. So that's part of what we do, and they provide buses. But there's such a hunger, and there's so many, you know, non Latino parents want their kids in immersion schools. So they don't even want the bilingual, they want to hear everything in Spanish. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have a great opportunity there. And I would say, you know, we worked with more than 40, 50 elementary and high schools, you know, throughout the year, and they, they come, some of them repeat times, which is unusual, they get more than one field trip. Uh, but I, there's a lack of resources, and they have such large Latino right. student bodies that this is work that's relevant to their families, to their culture. Great example is the hardest sector of the population to bring to the theater is the largest Latino sector, Salvadorans. They have a great history of visual art. But of course, the 12 year civil war, <clears throat> caused largely by our actions, had destroyed, their, destroyed the theater. And the, right. the, the writing stopped, the creation stopped. They're still recovering. So they don't come to the theater. We have this outreach. We have a, a, a Salvadoran born playwright who wrote a children's play called Volcanes about the myth of the volcanoes. I didn't know this. There's these mad dogs called Cadejos who protect the Salvadorians when the earthquakes erupt, and they protect them when they go abroad. Of course, all those people here. I had no idea that all of these kids know these myths. When we did this show, and we brought a lot of elementary schools, the post-performance discussion, the moderator's like, well, do you have any questions? I'm from El Salvador. Oh, yeah, wonderful and the question. I'm from El Salvador. I'm from, and they all started, and we just finally said, how many? And the whole class, <laughs> and my grandmother told me this story, and I remember this story. So it's a wonderful way of connecting them to that culture. So talk about your performers. How, where do you find your artists? So we, uh, we have a group of local artists that we've had from, um, some of them from the very beginning have stayed with us, who are bilingual, who work at other theaters. And then when we don't find a particular person, we also do international exchanges. We have a great ongoing exchange with um, 
these two guys in Spain who work with young artists, and they've come now six times. And every time their shows have been nominated for, for Helen Hayes, very interesting work. They work quite differently because they're the designers, directors, and actors work like eight hours a day from the beginning of the, they don't They don't bother with union regulations that so you can, you have to have rest time. So they're, they're great. We bring some artists from Spain through them. We, we have an exchange with Mexico. We brought a lead Mexican artist. We have a great exchange with this guy, Gustavo Ott, the playwright. When we brought him, he had a theater in Venezuela that's still going, amazing with the current crisis, yeah. called Teatro San Martin. And when we need artists, we reach out to them as well. So moving up to now, now we have to get everybody visas because before you could do cultural exchanges with a letter from the ambassador or embassy saying they're here for a cultural program. And now, then that takes, that takes time and it takes money. Now and it, it takes, takes time and money and energy. So everybody's got to have a working visa. So it's getting harder and harder. But it's a wonderful pool, and it also is a great experience because the artists who come here take something home with them, and our artists gain all of these skills from working with people internationally. And you've been recognized internationally as well. Mm -hmm. You've received the DC Mayor's Award mm -hmm. for Excellence in Service to the Arts, the Order of Queen Isabella II, mm -hmm. conferred by the King of Spain, mm -hmm. Juan Carlos uh, I, and uh, the Founders Award of the Cultural Alliance of Greater Washington. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact is that people who have experienced your art, who have benefited from your art, mm -hmm. from the art of your organization, recognize the unique contribution it makes to the quality of life of children, of adults, of people in this DC region. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's really wonderful to behold how your sensibility mm -hmm. and your husband's sensibility as young people, this, this idea and this idea of going over, around, through any obstacle, um, yeah. how that is, uh, has, has taken form today. And I know that there are still challenges. What's the future hold for the There are a lot of challenges. And the past, I mean, I take my hat off to Ugo because he rose above, you know, it, it happens with any ethnic theaters or social where, where people want to pull each other down and right. you get in the community because we're both a professional theater, but we're community organizers. And he just would soar above it. And I'm like, no, let's, you know, those people can't say that about us. We're not elitist. <laughs> we're not communists. We're, you know, theater people. And he just plowed ahead. And we, we both do. We both, you know, it's it's, it's Compl worth. You compliment each we other? Compliment. And then Abel Lopez has been great. He's been with us for 35 years. And he's actually head of arts uh, right now in um, Americans for the Arts. And so he's got an outreach nationally and an eye out there and is directing this show. So, but the challenges are many. You know, there's always the funding challenge. There's always the challenge of of personnel and growth, there's no, it's very hard to get general operating funds. Everything is like education, which is great because we have a great education program, right. but we need more than that. And we need staff money. We need to expand. We're still only eight people doing all of these programs, and that's just too little. But it's, it's always uplifting. I mean, I wouldn't have done anything else in, in my life at all. When I once complained, my stepmom said, well, you could have, you could be bored and have married a dentist. And I said, well, <laughs> This, this, you know, people come to us now in our Three Kings celebration, for example, which is free community thing we do in January 6th for the other day. Kids who came when they were kids are now parents bringing their kids to that. So it makes me feel old but happy, right? <laughs> well, Rebecca Batano, I cannot see you being bored and marrying a dentist. <laughs> 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 thank you thank so much you for so sharing much. It was your a pleasure. insights. Come and see thank the show. you. Be our guest. We love, we love Howard University, too. Executive Director of Gala Hispanic Theater, go visit. Thank you so much. <laughs>